forgot that or somewhere in the body that was left on a shelf somewhere that prayer is powerful and it may be a serious we are kings and priests unto our God we're not just normal average people living on this earth if you're a member of the body of Christ you are different and we have commissions no one else in this earth has. We have rights, opportunities, promises, and authority that no one else has except those who've received Jesus Christ as their Savior. And he gave it to us himself. No one should be living or expecting fear or violence against them. Not one person in the body should be expecting or planning for it in any way whatsoever. You should be taking authority over it, crushing the plans of darkness, pushing them back. Amen? We're supposed to be a voice for God, represent him, manifest his absolute power and presence in this earth to move things that no longer be moved by things. We're supposed to move them, shake them, and shift them for him. So that's really who you are. And we all have that same commission to do that. We may have different ways we do that. And everybody is needed by God. Everybody has a gift or is a gift. And he needs all of us. That's why we're a body. I know some of them want to separate themselves from us. I don't know what they think they're going to do is a finger or a, a leg somewhere, you know, without any part of a body to be with. And I think the thing that would bless him the most is to see us coming together. <clears throat> I'm excited about the prayer uh, convocation. You know, if my people that is coming up in Orlando... And it will be live streamed everywhere. You can go to um, Global Fire Ministries, I think. Uh, Jeff Jansen is involved in that, that wild man. <laughs> I heard he was in charge. He's my friend. I heard you're in charge. Am I coming? <laughs> because we really are praying. It's about praying for the president, for the elections, for God's will, God's way. And I know I'm wearing, yes, I am wearing the president right here. See him? If you don't like him, get over it. <laughs> He's not going away. Woohoo! <laughs> we actually have some Trump flags about that size back there on our table. Oh, yeah, fly them as big and high as you can because heaven is. <laughs> heaven looks at his tweets. You're like, man, yes, they pray, okay, but still. God chose him. He is, he is a wrecking ball. He's also a bulldozer. He's also a builder. He inspires. He does empower. And no matter what anyone ever says to you, he loves America and he loves the people of America. All of us, no matter what color we are or where we come from, if you're an American, Trump loves you. And what he does is for the people, say for the people, by the people. That's what he believes. That's actually what anybody in leadership in this country should believe that and be living that. No one is a dictator. Although some would like to believe they are and are practicing that right now. <laughs> and they'll be sorry they practiced it. I get a lot of inside information. Some from the Trump administration. Some from heaven. Because nothing is hidden, right? I do have a message and it is about America. It's about God's plans for America. So you know what the truth is, because there's so much stuff going on. And by the way, uh, the tribulation isn't coming yet. I'll throw that in. For, if I say news bulletin, if I, whenever I say news bulletin from heaven, the Holy Spirit just said it to me. And he's just saying to me, it's not the tribulation. It's not the perilous times. The four horses of the apocalypse are still in the barn. 
He likes to say that one. <laughs> Things are not going to get worse, except for those who don't want God. <laughs> except for those who don't want life, okay? It, they may have some real, real strong issues coming up, especially November the 3rd, <laughs> because Trump will win. And it doesn't matter where I do a broadcast or where I go and speak, the Father will say, you better say that. And say as bold and loud as you can that Trump will win on November 3rd in 2020. Because God wants us to have a life and a future. Not just hope for a future, but a future greater than it ever has been before because this all is happening in God's shifting time. When he is going to shift, and I know him well, the first thing he does is expose all the darkness. And I hear from people, why is all this awful stuff going on? And it's been there all along. It was just hidden. And I literally just heard from someone in the Trump administration saying, make sure you talk about how deep the exposure will happen. <laughs> and they know things we don't know right now. I mean, from the highest person in the land. And there'll be dominoes fall. If you've ever seen dominoes fall, it takes everything with it. That is what will happen in the political arena, in the news arena, in the business arena, in the lying, cheating, stealing arena, and those who paid and trained for the violence. God, God is not going to allow. So you know what? People will know the truth. No matter what the fake news, I don't have my button. I should have brought my fake news button. I was going to push it right now. <laughs> People are saying, where did you get that? Is really Trump saying, you're fake news. You're just fake, fake news. <laughs> you should see me embarrassed. You're fake news. <laughs> and I think what these people don't understand, that God chose someone who's not afraid of people. He's not afraid of the darkness. He's not afraid of evil, obviously. He's not afraid of being, you know, called names or wrongfully accused, unjustly accused. That doesn't even touch him. So they're wasting their time and a lot of their money trying to make that happen. And I know he has a plan. I'm not telling you about that plan. I'm not telling you about Trump's plan. You'll find out about that. But I can tell you that heaven's very excited about what's going to be happening over the next few months. And especially this next year. And I know, bless her heart, some of the millennials are thinking this is never going to end. You know, is, are we ever even going to have a life, you know? Will we be able to live somewhere? Will, will we actually be alive or will we die? And I go, you need to know God. Because God has all those, <laughs> he has all those answers, right? And I'm always somewhere near where they're talking. They don't know me, but they're having discussions about how their life, they're, they're wondering if they'll be able to live, you know, if they can live through the virus plague. It's not a plague, people, okay? It's not a plague, <laughs> People act like it is. They want to they they make you think it is. And uh, heaven is against social distancing. <laughs> and they're even against the masks. Now, if you feel like you have to wear one, if you're going into the hospital, if you're going to see senior citizens, and they would rather you wear one than do it, but trust me, it's okay. And I'm praying that on, on November 3rd, Trump will say, I'm here to say, go burn your masks. <laughs> he absolutely is not happy about these different governors and mayors saying you can't hold church. Or, you have to hold it outside. You can't talk to each other. You can't like, <laughs> they need Jesus. 
and, and he, Trump is not happy about any of that part. And let's tell me, he's getting more and more information because guess who he finally talked to? People. He didn't talk to the professionals who weren't giving him the truth. I happen to know he's doing this. He's actually talking to people, people who know the truth about these things, even considering them concerning the virus, okay? I've even stopped calling that the quarantine because I don't even want to call it a virus. And I'm telling you, this is what God has always said from the beginning. It's going to pass. It'll pass. It'll be gone like it was never there. And he said, your lives will be so powerful. And he wants us to know each other, to come together. Because you know what the Bible says about that, right? And I'm sure that the other side would like to keep us all apart, because it gets dangerous. The more of us who want what God wants, it becomes dangerous for hell when we come together. And so, but I do have good news today that God is absolutely involved in this country. And four years ago, when he made the declaration that he would be involved for 24 years without stopping in the White House. 24 years of God in the White House. <clears throat> he hasn't changed his mind no matter what they're showing in the news or what they're saying, broadcasting, forecasting, or just lying about. It isn't going to help that side. You need to really pray for them because it was devastating the last time that they lost. And if they would stop feeding their own soul things that weren't true, then they would not expect it to happen. But unfortunately, there's people who for the last, these last four years kept feeding on what the fake news was saying. I don't mind saying any of that, okay? Uh, I don't have no problem saying it anywhere because it's the truth. They fed lies. I know people, the kindest, most gentle people, have become almost vicious because it's filled their soul. It's filled the layers of your soul. As a man thinketh in his heart, which is your soul. That word heart means the core of your being. That's where your soul is. As a man thinketh in his soul, so is he. So because their thinking has changed over these last years because of what they're feeding it. That's why he says, guard your soul. Guard what you let go in. Guard what you let go out. Because then you impact people's souls when you speak or portray things. And I can tell you from the God of heaven and earth, he is fed up with the fake news. He's fed up with the lying liberals that don't want life, that want to control, that want to take your life away. Every bit of this is truth. This is the truth. Okay? Their platform is the worst I've ever seen in my life. You don't want communism or socialism. I lived through the 60s as a teenager. I know what that stuff was like. And if you don't understand, you should go look up some of the countries that, that live that way. And why are there people trying to escape? Venezuela is a good example. I tell them, why don't you go live there? The ones that want it that way, go take vacation and live there for two weeks. And when you come back, you won't want it anymore. Amen? There is no life in that. It's like death. And God said, this day I offer you life or death. Choose what? So if, you, if you're agreeing with the side that wants death and even helps death, you're on the wrong side. Choose life. If you want life, you choose life. Okay, you offer life. And what we say from here should bring life and hope and joy and even celebration and even creativity. If we represent heaven in this earth, then we should be like them. Amen? Amen. Where well, everyone in heaven is rooting for Trump. There's a lot more for him than, than are against him. I literally know people in foreign countries who are praying for him to win. They don't want the other. They don't want what's being offered, especially if they're already living in it. And these aren't anybody I even know, and they don't even know me. They don't know me for cat cur. But people want life around this world. They want hope. If they have families and they love those families, and God gave us our families to love, to be a part of, to share things with, and yet there is a side who is 
owned by Satan. And you always know what that side is because it wants violence. It portrays violence, acts of violence, and they don't care who they're violent against. Satan doesn't care who dies. And the ones he's been using, when they die, he won't care either. There is no love in that camp. There's no love in hell's camp. Just death and destruction. And he does not, and hell is terrified right now. They're terrified. That's why they're doing whatever, whatever they can to show the worst, saying this is the way it is. They, they want people to think all of America is in turmoil, and they want civil war so bad, I can't tell you how much they want civil war. They want us to fight each other. And we're not going to do it. Say amen. amen. And the reason why we won't do it is we want a life. We care, right? God cares about every person. I had an opportunity to minister to people. and God's going to touch Vietnam. I'm just letting you know right now. He's going to take that and shift that country. He's shifting that government to shape that nation. And if you weren't a teenager in the 60s, you don't maybe, maybe not know what that means, or if you weren't ever involved in that war that was the most senseless war in the world, practically. They were trapped in it, too. But there's been amends made between some of our older military and leaders in Vietnam. That did have to happen. But God is going to shift that government. They're socialists right now, but he's going to shift it. You watch it. Because he's into shifting governments and shaping nations. That's another thing he's actually using Trump for. Because God loves business. If you didn't know, Jesus is also CEO in heaven. He has a boardroom. He has special places for a reward for people that poured out their stuff for him on the earth. They get to work with him in, in the head office. <laughs> We always say orders from headquarters. They do have a headquarters, and that's where Jesus is, sits as CEO. So they're all about business. Why would he send his son as what? Say a carpenter. Is that business? Yes. So he sent him. And even Paul was in business. He worked in, in uh, fabrics and colors, and he made banners and apparel and tents. I mean, a lot of the, fish, oh, the fishermen, how about that one? That was business. Even Luke, right? I mean, he used a lot of people in business. You know why? They can cross boundaries that people in ministry sometimes don't have an opportunity to cross. So Jesus, being raised as a carpenter, he sat with sinners because he had business deals with them. People, why did he do that? He, was, he had carpentry. He did carpentry, a master carpentry. He had designs in carpentry. He didn't just nail wood together. <laughs> it was his art. It was his gift. He still does that in heaven. He doesn't ever take your gift away. So how important is business to God? A lot. And, and really, more and more, you will see believers become entrepreneurs over these next 10 years more than ever before. Because God doesn't just talk to me about right now. He usually does it in like a 10-year span or a 50. He's even talking to me in a 50-year span. You're not going anywhere for a while, okay? Don't plan to escape. Roll up your rapture rock. Stick it in the closet, give it away to the next couple generations beyond you. Wait about 80 years and then give it to them. Might be closer. I don't think about the rapture. It's not my job. We know there is one, and I'm totally saying there is one, but I'm not told when that is, and actually not even Jesus knows. So focus on now, your race, the one you're running right now with God that will shift and change things, create new things in the earth. The technology is going to be crazy. If you think it's something now, I still try to use my, I got a new cell phone that doesn't help me much at all. Some things I like, some things I don't. I go to the gym all the time. What is this doing? Why do I have to do this? Where did it go? <laughs> so my number one thing I say to her is, where did it go? <laughs> Because I can't find it. <laughs> oh, make it go away. 
I either can't make it go away or it went somewhere. I don't know where it went. And people are saying, well, take a class. God's saying, you're not taking a class. You're not taking a class of anything that has to do with the earth. You get schooled in heaven, okay? I get my schooling in heaven that leaves my soul free from anything else like man's head knowledge. I got people that can do that for me. But he literally won't even let me listen to bad conversations, death, dying, sickness, and disease. Uh, you know, things I've noticed about pastors, I know y'all don't do this, but when I get invited a lot of places and we go out to eat, do you know what they talk about the most? The worst disease, catastrophes, or traumas their congregation has ever gone through. And I'm like, that is not conducive to a fine dining atmosphere. Can we talk about vacations or the different seasons on the earth or God's good plans? And if these people are dead and in heaven, why are you bringing it up? Because they're not going to come back. So make sure you check out your conversation. Even people you don't know when you meet them, give them something good. When you leave them, they've got something good in their soul, right? I think a lot of people need that. They need some good news or fun news. It's okay to have fun. My hair does that for me right now. Now I know one day it'll be so normal for people to go around. And more and more, I see companies allowing their their employees to have highlights in their hair. I've even advised them to, you've got free advertising because if they go something, they're going to go, well, what are you about? What do you, what do you, what do you do? You know, free advertising. They could talk about where they work and the stuff they do because I know people want it. Almost 99% of the people like my hair except some ministers. <clears throat> And I laugh because when they get to heaven, <laughs> they'll be visiting the salons themselves. <laughs> because this is normal. This is just heaven culture. That's what it is. It's exciting. It's fun. It's nice looking, right? So why not? It's like having some really nice apparel, but you wear it on your head. <laughs> And uh, I recently got a letter from a child. I always know it's a child because they don't spell the words right. And they like to print. And I know when they, when they addressed the envelope, they tried really hard to write in cursive, but it was all scribbly. And they scratched through some of it and rewrote it. And I went, this has to be a child. And it was like 10 questions, best questions ever. <laughs> they, never, they never ask any boring anything, okay? <laughs> It was exciting, and I went, and he said, and please write back to me. And I went, well, I found out that he lives in Denver, Colorado, and I'll be going there in October, so I'm going to get a hold of his parents, and I'm going to make a visit. <laughs> I'm going to make a surprise visit <laughs> and say, hey, I have your answers. <laughs> And uh, I, I love to talk to kids because they're never sitting there going, well, I don't believe that. Well, where is that in the word? Oh, God wouldn't want to do that. And I'm like, no, they're like, I want to hear more. That's exciting. Wow. I always wondered about that. You know, they ask wild questions. And they believe so much that what God says is true. They actually believe what the Bible says. They don't try to change it because they don't understand it. <laughs> and yes, I have a King James Version, if you ever wondered. I didn't go stick it in the bottom of my closet because somebody came up with something better. <laughs> it's one of the few Bibles that actually says there's unicorns in heaven. Why would I get rid of that? <laughs> Nine times in the King James Bible, it mentions unicorns. And so somebody changed it to rhinoceros in the new translations. And I can always remember two of the verses. I think one is Psalms 29 and one is Psalms 92. Uh, there are seven other ones, but for me it's easier to remember them. One, God talks about the power of the horn of his unicorn. Guess what he rides in heaven? The father has a unicorn. That's what he rides. 
Jesus has a horse. Holy Spirit has one. They love horses. They're all over heaven. It's one of the favorite creatures that he ever invented. He loves the power that's in that horse, the excitement, you know, when it says it runs into the battle. It doesn't, it's not afraid of the sword. It's not afraid of anything. And uh, I think I could always see into the soul when I would look into the eyes of a horse. I thought, you know, I can see. It does say the eyes are the windows to the soul. And uh, so in heaven, if you have one, they'll talk to you. But the father actually has a unicorn, this amazing unicorn that he rides. And he talks about it in the Bible. And people thought, I think these people who were trying to interpret, I think they just missed that completely because I don't think there's unicorns anywhere. You tell children that, yes, I know I have one and I'm going to name it right now. <laughs> That's why you must be like little to enter into the kingdom of. That's why I like to talk to children. And people go, oh, no, they'll, they, I, I tell them if they're five and up, five and up, bring them in. And some of the four-year-olds, okay, set them on the front rows because they already had those rows planned for other people. <laughs> and they went, oh, they won't listen. Oh, yes, they will. And I talked to them for two hours, and all they do is giggle and say yes, and they were excited. And their teachers are like, they haven't even moved out of their chair. <laughs> because they found that God is exciting and filled with adventure. Say adventure. adventure. The greatest adventures you will ever have aren't on this earth. They're in heaven. And then after heaven, you don't just have one world to do things with. When he makes the new heavens and the new earth, you visit planets for fun. Say amen. amen. Why not? He's God, right? You know, right now you live in heaven when you pass. Your body's sleeping, but your spirit and your soul are there in heaven. And you get to see amazing things and step through doorways like you're in the middle of the cosmos. Uh, you just step through this big opening. It's called the observatory in heaven. It's got these ancient, like, big stones. And you step off. You don't see it when you're standing there, but when you step off out into nothing, you're literally in the cosmos looking at it. So why wouldn't he make fun planets for us to enjoy our lives on when all this stuff is over and time is no more? You won't be bound by time, right? Or space, which means you can have more than one thing in the same space. That might be too much for your mind. <laughs> we have the most amazing future as believers than anyone in this world. And when I talk to them about Jesus, I talk about that stuff. Not just, yes, of course, I talk about uh, actually explain in detail more about his crucifixion, but he actually died in the garden first. I know they talk a lot about the cross. They should talk more about the garden. And when I saw that cup or that bowl, where is it right here? It rocked me because that cup he drank out of, if that had a stemware, it would look just like that. It's empty. They have it in heaven. <clears throat> Although... Now, I don't know if you know this, but God hand-picked the two angels that would bring that cup to him in the garden that he had to drink. There was every evil wickedness, every sin, every disease, every act of violence, everything that was evil was in that cup. He died when he drank it because he said, not my will. Didn't he say, let it pass from me? They need to talk more about that cup. So he was already dead to himself, and he had to be dead to himself when he went to the cross. The cross wasn't that hard for him. It was taking that cup, and that perfect holy being had to take all of it. And let me tell you, I saw that cup, and if I was Christ, I probably would have said the same thing. But you know, he was alone in the garden, except when those two angels came. And one of the movies I'm doing stuff for, you actually see 
in heaven when the Father picks those angels, gives them their assignment, and you see him making this cup and putting all of that in it because it, it's a spiritual cup. And they brought it to him in the garden, and then when he drank it, they comforted him. They were doing it before he had to drink it because they were there to support him. Knowing what they were bringing, you'll know what they were thinking all the way down to earth with that cup. It was very significant. That's why it's significant to die to yourself. Christ did his greatest things after he died to himself. And although I don't die to go to heaven, I die every day so I can reveal it. Because I can't have myself in any of this. I had to die to myself. I have to do it all the time. And he takes me all the time. And I know a lot of stuff that goes on in heaven. I know a lot about the spirit realm. I know uh, after over 20 years of going, being taken there, and being taken back to the past and into the future, I do know a lot. And so I, I tweak myself. I won't allow anything in my soul that is against God. I won't keep one word spoken in my presence or one word or one image I saw on the TV or anywhere else. I get it out of my soul. I can't have it. I'm not going to have a mix. Can I want God and only God. And I want his will, his way, not mine. And I tell people, it doesn't hurt when people say stuff because I'm not there. He is. And this is his plan. And he wants us to know him like that. You have such creativity in you beyond what you could imagine or anyone on this earth could think or imagine. We were meant to be creators. Say creator. creator. Why? Because he's a creator. Correct? And just getting simple revelation on some of the scriptures, it'll change you forever to understand that when he took Moses and hid him in the cleft of the rock, that was inside himself. He took Moses and put him inside him and showed him all of time that had passed before that moment that he met him. Moses saw him creating the heavens and the earth. Moses saw the ice age that happened. Moses saw the earth split in pieces and separate so it wasn't just one landmass anymore. Moses saw all of that. He couldn't share with people. So that scripture that says he hit him in the clefts of the rock and as I pass by, I will show you my hinder parts. He wasn't saying I'm going to show you my back. I will show you all the time that is behind us. What an amazing mystery of revelation that God would do this with a human being. And even Jesus, John was so close to him, it's no wonder he didn't die until he decided he wanted to. <laughs> he could have been here now. He was homesick, right? How many other of the disciples knew that his name was the Word? How many other disciples knew that he was with God and was God? John knew because of his relationship how much he loved him, how much he was with him, and he began to desire him more than anything, that's when God shows you mysteries. And John saw mysteries. No wonder he showed him some of the end times and the future. He took him to heaven and showed him great details in heaven. And even in time, the other people couldn't even think. They didn't want to read Revelation because they don't understand it. If you get Revelation a lot, you could understand everything that was said in that book. But God wants us to search things out. But the way you get them is by searching him out. Him first. <laughs> you can run after everything you want to, but you better be running after him first. Because John was a different person. John used to fight with his brother in the streets over girls. The sons of thunder, that wasn't their anointing. That was how they acted. And their mama, of course, who was their manager, <laughs> practically. And how much he changed him, so much so that he entrusted his mother to him. 
And he was saying to his mother, I'm no longer your son. I am your savior. So many things had to happen in order for Christ to be that person for everybody. You know, and you will so enjoy being with him in heaven. But I think because of the time that we're in, and especially your children and your grandchildren will have such powerful relationships, it would be nothing for them to step through a portal and go somewhere in the spirit realm and come back. They'll be shaking things. They're the ones who will speak to the mountain and make it jump into the sea, and they go, oh, I changed my mind, I'll put it back. And it will be like breathing, because sharing revelation is like breathing to me. I don't have to have notes. You never forget those things that you have with him or do with him uh, that he shows you or takes you to places. And yet people are so closed in a box. No, God can't do that with anybody. You know, he's too important and we're too lowly. And I want you don't even know who you are. We can't manifest his power if we don't actually believe he wants us to. And then they don't want to talk about scriptures like God said, command ye me, and it freaks them out. Someone's going to probably change that eventually in the Bible. <laughs> I don't like it. We shouldn't say that. Well, God said, he was saying command. He actually, <laughs> if you learn in some of the scriptures, like he said, if you flip it, that's what I'm saying. Like me, I say command, not command, you tell me what to do. You command. Jesus Christ was a commander. The Father was a commander. Holy Spirit is a commander. We're made in their image and after the way they operate, their likeness is how they operate. They're not talking about what they look like twice. Let us make man in our image what they look like. And after our likeness is how they operate. Well, how do they operate? Say without measure. Say without measure. In the time in the Bible, measures were given for certain things. But the closer we get to operating and ruling and reigning with Christ, some people will do things without measure. Why would he say we were kings? Those are spiritual kings. Male or female, kings. In the spirit, there is no male nor female. People think you don't look like that. You don't look like a male or female in heaven. I'm like, it's not talking about heaven. That means in the spirit, where our authority and dominion is, there is no difference in authority for a male or a female. That's what that means. He doesn't say only the men are kings and priests unto their God. We are kings and priests unto our God. Those are levels of authority and dominion. Occupy till I come meant you take dominion until I come. Not sit on your rapture rug. He never says, go hide somewhere and wait till I come back. We're supposed to be actively taking dominion and you have absolute right to do that as a believer don't wait for satan to come and bash you bash him jesus was never kind to any demons <laughs> he never put up with them it hurt them to be near him we should live in this earth to a point where demons are terrified and they all run because they actually hurt. It hurts them and pierces them to be around us because of the light and the glory of God coming from us. That's how we're supposed to live. And I've heard people give all different versions of that, like, we're so far above everybody, we should just ignore the devil completely. It doesn't say to do that either. <laughs> Jesus didn't ignore him. He said what he wanted to do. <laughs> then he went and tore him up in hell. God doesn't uh, tolerate. <laughs> 
Their government in heaven does not tolerate. Evil comes, kick them out. Unseat them, strip away their power, and they're out. Amen? We should be running our country like that. If you want to help bring hope, a people for everybody, no matter who they are, because God loves us all, God can't abide evil. But if he didn't love us, he would have never sent his son. He has hope for everybody. I will, you know, not everybody's going to go to heaven, but there'll be a lot more in heaven than you think there will be. Amen? And children have the most delightful time. But I'm happy about children on the earth. They will see and experience things we never have. Even the way they live. And how fun becomes a necessity to plan for. We plan our business week. We plan a, a vacation, maybe once, maybe twice a year, right? We, we have wedding plans. You make funeral plans. You make all kinds of plans. Estate planning, planning, planning. How about fun planning? Because a happy person makes you a happy witness. Don't be so serious about things that you can't laugh. Because for years, and I lived in those years, where you weren't even allowed to make things look like they were funny. Especially in the church. And then the laughter hit. Wasn't that funny? <laughs> Rodney Howard Brown bushwhacked everybody. God used him. I was there when they came in. They'd get stuck to the wall and couldn't stop laughing, okay? Climbing under the chairs, not being, you know, proper. <laughs> that was God's order. Happy disorder. <laughs> so I know things are going on. I don't ignore what's going on. I just say things to make it change. You know, I take authority over darkness anywhere. I don't have to be by the darkness. I'm not tolerating it. I am not tolerating it. Not in my body, not in my home, not in my city. I intend to make Florida a region of light. I live here. I'm not tolerating evil here. No, I bash the witches all I can. Because there's a lot here. If you didn't know that, we're right near some right now. They're probably screaming. There are people who need to be free. I'm talking about not the people who practice it. I'm talking about these spirits who deceive them and trap them into that lifestyle. And sometimes it's generational. They need to be free. But wherever Satan controls, what do we do? No, you shouldn't be bored at all in your life. If you ever watch the news, you got a ministry right there. You make assignments for the, for the army, send them everywhere you see stuff's going on. If I hear about it, they're gone. I'm up all night long, I'm up at 20 hours anyway. Ask my husband, I'm out in the middle of the street at 3 a.m. with my staff. And I have five different ones and I use them for different things, get a staff. Where do you get them? Any place that has things about hiking will sell just a simple staff. God used him in the Bible. People used him in the Bible. They can carry the glory. They can carry the fire. They can carry your anointing that God gave you. When you hit it, it causes like a shock wave that comes out of there and goes through. It penetrates everything in your neighborhood. People either move or they like me. It only begins... By becoming a believer. After that, you pursue things. Seek ye first. What do you seek? What do you pursue? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness sake. And all these things, all the things you actually need to live, will be added to you. If you live that way, that's exactly how your life will be. 
You don't hear me asking people for stuff to go do things, right? I just obey him. I pursue what he wants. Whatever he, do, he, whatever he says is priority, and he'll change something in the middle of my day. Jen knows that too. My baby sister knows that. <laughs> he'll change your nice little schedule you'll got, and you think it's messed up. It's not. It's just been made perfect. You'd miss divine appointments, divine encounters. I mean, I, I do agree we have to have some kind of regulated life, <laughs> especially if you're raising a family, but don't leave the encounters and the experiences and the joy of God out of their lives. Let them look forward to that stuff. Let them expect it. I was visiting my family in Texas, and my grandson had an encounter with the living God in his room. So everybody else was asleep, but guess, guess who? Not. He runs out of his room. His eyes are this big. I heard God speak. I heard him. I heard him. He's eight. He, ought, he knows everything I do. He's all excited. He's been taking trips to heaven since he was three. So it's generational. I'm going to make sure that keeps going. He comes out of his eyes. Big, I heard the voice of God. I heard him speak. I heard him. I heard him. Well, at his birth, he almost died. The devil wanted to take him out because he's a prophet. And he can see that even on children that they are. So he's strong, very creative. Even at three, he would say things you would be shocked at what he would say. And he's running out and I said, I heard, I heard the voice of God. I said, well, what did he say? He said, he said to me, I saved your life for a purpose. And now that purpose will be fulfilled. I said, that was God. He didn't need me to tell him that. He already knew. He was just sharing it. So I wrote it down for him and gave it to him so he could share. His parents were beside themselves because they feel him full of God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Uh, this kid can't ever go to public school. He'd be baptizing people in the water fountain or in the bathroom in the sink. He will pray for any sick person. And he casts out devils. I knew they'd never be, he'd be in so much trouble, they'd be calling all the time down to the school for something. Like, but they're all like that. He's the oldest. And they all know who God is, and they experience him. That's how we're supposed to. Pass it to the next generation. Don't keep it for just you. And if they aren't willing, find the next one down the line somewhere. You know, God actually... Picked my sister to be mentored by me, and she probably thought that was for a couple years. That was a long time ago. And she didn't want to at the time. He says, I'm giving her to you for a season. It's been a long season. <laughs> because she's number 15. She's the caboose. And God wanted her to be as filled with him as I am. And then let her discover stuff on her own with him. And she's writing books for the children in the world about heaven. But what she sees and knows is truth is what she will be putting in those books. But they won't be normal. If you've ever looked up a children's book about dying, well, it's like a new leaf, then here's the old one. And that dead, shriveled leaf is supposed to be what happens to the person. Mm -mm, that ain't going to happen in these books. <laughs> We don't hide God. We wear him, we walk with him, and we speak for him. And people know they have encountered God. They've heard things they've never heard before. Their mind can't be the same. Because it's in their soul and they don't know how to take it out. Now, we all know here, how many people know how to do a soul checkup? Let me see your hands. We will do them before we leave. I do them every day. Uh, yeah, I've even seen, yeah, God calls me his soul doctor. And I literally was taken in the future, and I saw, and I was walking down the hallways of some churches, then into a big business building, and they had a little plaque outside that said soul doctor on the door. That means these people will know and understand how with God you can lose stuff out of everyone's soul and it will be gone like it was never there. 
instead of going for six weeks of psychiatric treatment, even if it was a trauma you had 40 years ago and you saw something, it will be erased like it was never there. Because God doesn't have time for us to wait six weeks, six months, six years to be whole. He wants you whole and not just whole. That's divine health. Say divine health is being whole. That's not sick and healed. Sick and healed, sick and healed, sick and healed, sick and healed. Or just live with divine health. Even as your soul prospers, you will prosper and live in health. That's where it is in the Bible. So revelation, one revelation he gave me changed me forever. My family who does it forever. And there are people who out there who do it as a lifestyle. You don't keep anything in your soul that doesn't belong there. No traumas, no anger, no offense, no unforgiveness, no fear, no addictions. No, you don't have to have any of it. Why does he say guard your soul? That means you're in charge of it. You decide what you watch, what you say, what you hear. It all goes in here. And it gets stored like in files. Even phone numbers. If you can't find it, say, God, lose it from my soul. Bring it out. I've done it. I'm not kidding. I could not find this little scrap of paper. It was a pastor who had invited me in some other state, and I couldn't find it. I looked everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And finally, I sat at my desk. I said, I need it now. And I saw coming out of my soul this little piece of paper. It came out and went like this so I could see it. And the Holy Spirit said, why don't you write it down right now? I got my piece of paper, I wrote it all down, and it goes, shh, shh. Those things you're looking for that you saw or needed to remember, ask. Ask and you shall. It's not impossible. So all those things that you saw or heard, things that you need to remember, don't lose that from your soul. But, but being so free, you walk free every day, all the time, of anything of the enemy. Even if you live in the hardest place you've ever lived in your life, you can be happy. And you can be powerful. The more you dwell and think and meditate on stuff, it grows in layers in your soul. You don't want to do that if it's not something good. If you're going through a trauma, maybe you got hurt or wounded or somebody died and you're grieving so bad you can't get rid of it, loose the grief from your soul. It will go and it will be like it wasn't there. You'll still miss the person. You'll remember them. But that grief that pierces, you don't want a spirit of grief to attach itself. And the devil will just beat you up with that. If your kids get bullied at school, don't let them just try to continue in their life because guess what? They're going to remember it all the time because it was in their soul. It happened to them. Lay your hand on their head. As the watcher of my child's soul, I command and I choose to lose from their soul that whole event that happened when they were bullied. The words, the actions, the accusations. I lose it right now in Jesus' name and heaven will come down and pull it out of them. And it'll be like it never happened. I have testimonies of mothers and fathers who have done that. And their child goes along happy like it never happened to them. Instead of messing them up for 20 years, and that thing is still in them, don't let it stay there. And then after you bind, and I choose as a watch over this, to bind the love of God, the life of God, the presence of God, the joy of the Lord, I bind that to their soul in Jesus' name. Then they've had some of God, and no one can take it out of them. Then they're really happy. They're really excited. They can be creative. It is, it is an awesome thing to stand before God, and he will say to you, what did you do with your family? And this time, we don't have any excuse 
for letting things continue in their lives that aren't good or that happened to them. Get rid of it. Amen? It's called a soul checkup. It is the keys to the kingdom. And the Father visited me one time for four hours earth time and taught me in great detail how to have people lose stuff from their soul and then to bind God to it. And when I grew up, it was always binding the devil. If you want to keep binding him, bind him. That makes you happy, bind him. <laughs> Instead, stick the host of heaven on, crush his plans, pull down the strongholds and kick them out. That's more effective. We lose the stuff that we don't want in there. What you loose on earth by your declarations will be loosed from heaven. What you bind on earth, the things of God, the plans of God, his will, his way, his promises, his joy, his celebration, his expectation. You bind that and put that in your soul. That's how you will be. And then guess what? Your soul will begin to prosper. And guess what? You will begin to prosper. No matter what situation you're in, financially, emotionally, physically, you change it by using the keys to the kingdom. They were that important. It has to do with the kingdom. It is so valuable, it's worth everything you have to have that. It might require you to tweak your flesh <laughs> or to change the way you live by what you say and what you do. There's always surrender, right? Some people tell me, you're controlling me. I went, I'm not telling you to do anything. I'm sharing what he said. You know, you surrender. With the devil, it's control. But with God, it is called surrender. Lay down your life and find it in him, right? Take up your cross daily. Why? To crucify your flesh. <laughs> Some people don't even want to use the symbol of the cross anymore. That's old. We don't need to be talking about that. When that happens to be his carpenter's mark that he uses in heaven. Don't tell Jesus Christ you don't want to talk about the cross. <laughs> you didn't die. On it. Besides, to him it wasn't a horrible thing. It was a beautiful thing. Because look what he got for it. He got us. Amen. I think we just need a school of revelation somewhere. I won't be running schools. I don't have time. <laughs> Although Jeff Jansen forgot I said that and says I'm part of the seer school of the prophets. And we do have meetings sometimes about people who are seers or want to understand that more. If you're born to be a seer normally. You have it from the time you're little, but sometimes God does give you that extra gift. It's a gift. But people have it when they're born because the other side uses it too. And there are people who do other things under Satan's power, and some don't even know that they're doing it under Satan's power because they know they have these gifts. But they see the wrong things, and the guides tell them the wrong things that they're seeing. But, but Satan can't give a seer gift. He, can't, he can use it or abuse it. But God does give it, and he's going to give it a lot more in this time. Amen? But I don't want y'all to leave things. I don't want you to leave the way you were when you came here. I don't want anyone to leave the same. Okay, when you encounter heaven, it should change you every single time. And yes, pursue it. Pursue to see heaven before you die and your body sleeps. I mean, 50 years ago, if you'd gone up and said something that, let's take her out and tar and feather. <laughs> or I'll go get the tar, I'll get the feathers. You know, you can't. I couldn't have been born 50 years ago, or 60, or 70. I was born 50 years ago. I forget how old I am. But you wouldn't be running around in a pulpit and saying that. <laughs> but now people have gone bizarre on both ends. <laughs> They've gone extreme in the God's way and extreme in the weird flesh way. <laughs> you need to know the difference. 
But children especially should be so acquainted with the presence of God and who they are in him and the expectancy has for them as they grow. They already have greatness in them. He's just going to bring it out. Most children born now are to be great for God. Even if you don't know their gift, which should be pretty apparent, they're a drummer, they're drumming on everything, they're a drummer. If they never stop till it irritates you, they do it in public when you don't want them to, but they have such passion, they're a drummer. Get them some drums. <laughs> It's not that hard to identify, but it is something that's very important. Raise up a child in the way I made them to be in the bent, which means their gift. Raise them up in the gift I made them to be, and they will never depart from it. And people say that differently. No, raise up your child in the admonition of the Lord is to know the Lord, to follow his ways and to know him. But raise up a child in the way I made them to be is a talking about the gift the natural gift he gave them. Identify it. Make sure they get to use it. And they will never want to be somebody else. Does that make sense to you? And God said, people sit on the pew every Sunday trying to figure out what their child's spiritual gift is. But they ignore the physical gift. They ignore the natural gift. And yet that's who he sent them as, that like his son was sent to be a carpenter from the time he sent him, he was a carpenter. He just not happened to put him with Joseph. He on purpose put him to be with a master carpenter because of the gift he put in his son. So make sure you're identifying, even if it's years later, you should have already understood why do they like this? Why do they want to do that? Why do they want to go there all the time? And if they connect with it and understand it, encourage them. Some may be doing something. It's their gift. It's not with God. Pray that God gets them, turns them onto his path. That's hot. That's cold. Hot, cold. I'd rather you be hot or cold and not lukewarm. You know what that is? I'd rather them be hot. That means you know your gift. You're using it for him. You're hot. Over here is you know your gift. You're using it but don't know him. That's cold. All he has to do is turn them, and they're hot. Lukewarm, I don't care what it is. I have no desire to use it. I'm just over it. You know why he says that? Because he can't use you in his plans. The plans he has for you, I'll spew you out of my mouth, doesn't mean you're going to go to hell. It means he can't use you in the way he wants to. So hot or cold, if your kid is using their gift, you need to celebrate, Right? And just pray, Holy Ghost, go get them, turn them, put people across their path, that their eyes be open, that they understand, yes, that's who God made you, but you need to do it for him. So we, we, we come sometimes wanting, you know, of course, I'm waiting for the day when you step in and the fire sweeps over everybody. <laughs> and you walk around and you look like burning infernos, okay? That's going to happen anyway. It's a time thing. It is a time thing. It's on his timeline. It's on his timeline. Or I wouldn't be talking about it. It's on his timeline. Baptism in fire has already been sent. It's waiting for the day it shows up in the phoneless. Whole buildings will be consumed with the fire. I saw them, spiritual fire. But even will be open to the natural eye. And that has happened a few times in the past where people called the fire department. Because a building was on fire because people were in there experiencing it. And they called the fire department. They couldn't find out what was burning. They saw nothing burnt, but the fire was there. So you one day will walk around with the fire that's in you being seen on you. That's. We're working on our 2021 calendar. It's called the fire and the glory. And you will get absolute detailed revelation on each one, where it is, but see an image of it. You will actually know what it looks like. 
So that's what we're working. It's all by revelation, and it will shift people so quickly when they look at that and realize this is for us. I'm alive. I'm breathing now. It is for us. Amen? The knowledge of the glory. You know, that's the knowing and understanding of the glory of God covering the earth. It's you taking it. That's not the glory just being dropped on everybody. It's you carrying it, you taking the glory that comes out in shock waves. And you can hear it. And people get consumed and they're gone. <laughs> they're, either, they're either taken into the spirit realm. Literally, I'm not kidding. They may be gone and disappear for a while and come back. They may be knocked out and not be there but taken somewhere in their spirit. When the glory begins to come from you, it will be so devastating to the enemy. And if you go into Walmart and do it, all the people in Walmart will be hit with it. You can't, you can't hide. People can't hide or try to escape from some of these things that God is going to do. And that calendar will talk about all of it. And that's God's best way for me that he uses me is to take a calendar and either release something, uh, make you aware of it, show you exactly what it looks like because an image is worth a thousand words. And he works with me with images all the time. So the first one on the host of heaven, the army of heaven, that was our first calendar. The second one was all about heaven. We have a few out there on that table. And you see places in heaven that literally exist, exactly how it looks, what happens there. It gives you a greater understanding and revelation on heaven. But the one of the fire and glory is going to be very powerful because these are things that we will all experience and do. It's things you will do. You'll even know what to do with it. So this is how God, that's why he gave his word, he put it in writing in his word in writing so you would have great understanding of him and the things that have happened the things that are coming but when you add an image it changes everything then you know this is supposed to happen this is what i need to run after my friend got baptized in fire and i wanted it and i was already pursuing jesus but i kept asking I want that fire. I see that fire. Their change are so bold. I want it. I want it. And I finally got a measure. <laughs> Knocked me slap out into the congregation three or four rows back. My body vibrated for eight hours. They locked me in the church. I wasn't in my body. Two angels came and carried me back in time and set me on the ground outside the tomb of Christ, literally in that time.